Steve Del Arto, welcome back to the Pre-Construction Podcast. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks for having me. You're great, and I love the green screen in the background. It's a much improvement from the last time. Uh, yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> I learned the hard way. <laughs> Very good. Well, listen, anybody hasn't caught Steve's first podcast, it was brilliant. Uh, we got great feedback. But one topic in particular that people were asking more about was artificial intelligence, AI within construction. So I wanted to get you back on to dig a little bit deeper on that because we literally just touched the, 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 the tip of the iceberg the last time. So give us just kind of to, to refresh people's memory and also to give the more junior people within the industry, give us an idea of AI, what it is and, and what it's doing right now within construction. Uh, yeah, thanks, Gareth. Um, you know, AI technically stands for artificial intelligence, you know, in all reality. Um, augmented intelligence is also how it also uh, generally phrase um, the focus, at least how it's going to be useful in construction in the near term. But, you know, if you really think about uh, the data and the process and all the workflows, you know, if we just talk about pre-construction solely, uh, there's just a ton of different workflows and the data that's generated out of those workflows uh, really for the most part now isn't structured. It's not organized. It's not characterized in a way that where, whatever application you could develop that would want to pull that data in and do something with it, uh, really the state of the data in our industry just isn't there. The mm -hmm. current software doesn't help really organize it. Companies aren't really situated to have that you know, centrally reposited in a, in a place that can be stored and utilized. So when you think about uh, the potential for artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence, you know, what we're really talking about is not replacing uh, the human and the talent that's, you know, essential to the process, but rather assist the human or augment them with additional computation that's more automated and it's also automatically generated across massive amounts of data sets to give you a, you know, some form of predictive uh, analysis of a particular problem set, or maybe it's just a range of figures based on a particular typography or whatever it may be. But a computer can just do that so much faster, more rapidly than the human can. And if you have that at your disposal, and you can rely on a computer to do that very tedious work for you, it frees up all of your time to do what the human needs to do uh, and can do best in you know, planning a project, interfacing with the client, really thinking through how to plan the project, what are the strategies. These are things that you know, a computer isn't going to do as well. So you know, AI and augmented uh, intelligence solutions uh, you know, really are going to become a key part of us solving also what we're also going to be um, encountering, which is a, a capacity deficit in our industry where we just don't have the number of people and the number of people with the right experience level to really support all of the work that will be coming as the growth of our country and as the growth globally occurs over the coming decades. Um, you know, the, the cousin to AI that is almost spoken in the same breath is ML or machine learning. And that, you know, where you have what we do have in the industry is in pre-con, they're not like identical, but the process at some level is very repeatable and predictable and can be generally standardized. And when you have your processes in a state where they are, um, standardized and to some degree automated, a computer can also, as it as you run that data through it with the proper um, machine learning applications, it can teach itself how to do that and keep replicating it with less and less human um, intervention. Um, and again, it's time savings. You know, what we're really after is time savings, a greater degree of accuracy, um, which, you know, is a win for everybody, you know, the owner, the architect, the yeah, builder, yeah. the subcontractors. So, you know, I'm very keen on and excited about all the, um, the future potential that we will have with AI and machine learning. But really, that's kind of like 
third base. <laughs> we're not even at first base yet with the state of our data, as I mentioned before. Yeah. And, and Steve, to, to kind of get an understanding of where we're at and why we're not at first base, what will what will first base look like? Is it going to be a data set across uh, uh, the industry or is it going to be each individual general contractor sorting their own data set and getting their own information in, putting it into to, to their system and their, their tools and their technology and their workflows and structuring their data properly, or is it going to be? A, is it going to have to be a blanket approach? No, I think each company, you know, each company has their own data and mm -hmm. wants to have that data protected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's each company's you know competitive edge or secret sauce. Um, but at the same time, uh, what I think the the fastest and most complete way of going about it is leveraging industry-wide tools that enable the individual firm to uh, generate the data off of those tools, still protecting it. Because I think um, it's way too expensive, both just in actual cost, as well as diversion of focus of your core talent to not do what makes you money, build buildings, et cetera, and now you have to divert their attention to, you know, building whatever solution or platform you would envision uh, to try to do all of this in house. Uh, mm -hmm. I just don't think uh, that's in anybody's real financial interest, quite honestly. And I think that's the opportunity uh, that the industry uh, has before them, because I think there's plenty of people uh, really interested in bringing technology to the forefront to help solve these pain points for the industry and the industry being the builders, the owner developers, the architects, it's really a function of that group um, uh, partnering with technology to help do something that's purpose built for the industry as opposed to off the shelf um, solutions that aren't really specific or built to our unique needs and workflows. Yeah, I mean, if you if you think about that that practice within VDC and BIM, I mean, that hasn't been adopted, and now we're seeing the companies that did adopt that ten or fifteen years ago, they're at the forefront. They're winning. They're getting the, the projects. They're they're better communicating with their clients, the subcontractors. They're, they're just a way ahead. And the companies that didn't embrace that early are way behind, and they're trying to play catch up. Are we going to see the same? With data, if companies don't embrace this data, if they don't get it organized, if they don't get it in the data sets, if they don't get it structured and into workflows early, they could be left behind. Oh yeah, I think, I think really now, and I think COVID has really accelerated things by a factor of maybe three to five years in terms of everybody at least recognizing the need to um, embrace technology and do things differently. I mean, if you think about you know, there's a vast majority of contractors that still have all of their data on a server in a closet on their in their office premises, mm -hmm. and they haven't even migrated to the cloud. And so overnight, you tell everybody go home and work from home for the foreseeable future. And they're having to rely on VPN and other means of connecting to their, their information, which is cumbersome and slow and um, you know, not very convenient. And so I think everybody overnight felt that shock. And then as everybody um, started to adopt video conferencing, it's enough to connect and have a personal dialogue like we're having Gareth, but at the same time, when you have a room full of people and the people need to see and reference materials visually, whether it's, you know, charts and numbers, and understand how all of this is coming together. You know, pre-COVID, you for the most part had everybody in a conference room and stuff pinned up and everybody bring their binder full of printed out material. So at least you had it at your fingertips and could look things up. You can't do that in this setting and you need to really be able to curate all of this information in a way that, you know, the, the receiver of that information, you know, if it's your client, they can kind of see and get to the, the gist of what you're presenting. And I think that's been an eye opener for a lot of people. But you know, back to your point uh, previously about first base. I mean, first base right now is everybody's still very addicted and reliant to Excel spreadsheets 
And if you really inventory all of the workflows, again, focusing on pre-construction and not just from the general contractor's perspective, but if you're an owner, public or private doesn't matter, and you've hired a contractor to be your partner, and you also have to have access to information and maybe even do your own pro forma work. Likewise, the architect isn't just designing, there's a lot of workflow outside of that classic Revit model. You know, everybody's got dozens of different applications for each one of these workflows. A lot of it's Excel, but it's all, it's not like it's linked. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have blue beam outputs, you got PDFs, you got, you know, P6 schedules. You just got a, a myriad of different applications, if you could call Excel an application, but none of it is really tied together. None of it is terribly smart in, you know, in terms of doing something with that data and the data is not flowing anywhere. It's yeah. just sitting in that spreadsheet and that next team doing the other, another project can't benefit or access that data easily or at all. So I think first base is, you know, it's kind of a three stage process in terms of digital transformation, which is becoming a bigger buzzword, but you know, first base is just getting off of Excel and having at least the data stored. So you you're digitizing and structuring the data Step two is actually digitizing the workflows so that way you can leverage the data on a repeat basis to get smarter and smarter. And then the third is really an enterprise wide digital transformation where you know you are working within you know more platform cloud based tools that give you all that flexibility of you know the dynamic use of the data or the information or the easy retrieval of prior projects or whatever the case may be. But you, you've got to go through those stages in sequence. You got to, you know, get your data organized and structured. You got to then transform your workflows digitally. And then you've got to kind of do that across your company and making sure all of these are integrated. Yeah. And I mean, Steve, look, looking at your background, 26 years with Clark, you've grown the West coast from, 400 million, I think, up to, to 2 billion. I mean, you, you've, you've been there, you've done it, you've done it across many projects, type, different types. How, how realistic do you think this is to be able to say that in five to 10 years, that that's the way it's going to be? There's going to be structured data, there's going to be workflows, and this is how it's going to work. I, I mean, you've, you, you've, you've witnessed pre construction evolve throughout the last 25 years. How realistic is, is it that it's, it's going to happen? I think it will. I think yeah. things um, tend to, in this day and age, excel or accelerate at an increasing rate. Um, number one, number two. I think the projects, the customers, just the the time frames in which these projects need to be delivered these days are going to really force and drive it. Mm -hmm. But if I were a client um, and I look around, you know all of your banking and finance and all of that stuff they've invested billions of dollars a year to automate and make everything cloud-based and super convenient with all sorts of other custom reporting capabilities built in so that way everyday users are like you and i um you know don't even need to interface with another human mm -hmm. not necessarily advocating that for a pre-construction but if i'm <laughs> a client i'm looking around and going how is that industry so far advanced? And I'm here um, really betting everything on developing this asset. And I, I'm still having to deal with independent Excel spreadsheets and nobody can forecast anything. And I just feel this is very archaic. So I think the clients are gonna start demanding, you know, their partners to bring to the table, you know, more advanced tools and approaches. And I think that's a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, builders and architects on their own are already starting to try to figure it out. And I think those who do it and invest in it, people's time, they become more open-minded about trying technology out. You know, you're going to win some, you're going to win most, you know, there's a few that you'll try out and, you know, you may feel as a waste, a waste of time, but in the whole, you're going to be advancing so much more rapidly. And I think, you know, it's really one of those things where those who get out ahead and those who kind of uh, are the laggards, 
you're not going to be able to catch up. They're going to be, it's going to be like a full on sprint and you just won't be in a position to ever make up that lost ground. So I just always encourage people um, in a very positive way, you know, get on this. This is not like, um, uh, you know, everybody's starting from a common, you know, standing start right now. And I think the faster people embrace it and realize what it can do for them and all the power it will, you know, put in their, you know, their hands, it's, it's incredible. It's, it would be silly not to. Yeah, it's, it, there's no doubt about it. It's a long play, but it's a long play that you won't see a return on investment right away. And you may do over three or four or five years, but 10, 15, 20 years, you're setting yourself, your, your company up to be not only a leader, but to, to grow exponentially with technology would, as well as talent. I would argue the ROI timeframe is much shorter than that because okay. really... Um, as long as, I mean, if you go out and try to do all this yourself internally with your own resources and, you know, that's really out of your core competence to try to really get into developing full platforms, et cetera. So really the cost to you is whatever the cost of, you know, a subscription or whatever, and the time to initially organize all of that data, which isn't that big of a deal. But if you think about the the mitigation of errors and omissions and all of the benefits of, you know, uh, avoiding those things that cause you to write projects down either a little bit or a lot, uh, contingencies that, you know, you, you, you hope you don't blow through as you're trying to protect your margin. And if you're an owner, you know, the benefits of making intelligent decisions now based on um, more empirical data and more, you know, visualization of what that could be. The payback is almost instant. Brilliant. And yeah. so um, I think that's what people really need to realize too. And I think I mentioned this maybe on the last um, conversation we had, the lion's share of the pre-construction front end talent in any given company is probably operating on average at about a 40% inefficiency rate. Okay. The amount of tedious manual work and the things they have to go through to gather the information that they need to do the studies that they need to do or compile the GMP. I mean, it's astounding how inefficient our people are having to work. So just by having more automated workflows, data that's at their fingertips, uh, they're going to be so much more efficient. And if you can bring one, you know, basically a 40% uh, factor of inefficiency down to close to zero, I mean, you, you've almost like created and opened up half of your front end team um, to do um, increasing it by that 50% capacity, which is, you know, essential now as again, this uh, capacity deficit we're going to be dealing with, with, with talent. So I think the ROI is um, instant. And I think in the early stages, you just have to use intuition and common sense that if I do the following, uh, you know, goodness, it's got to help. And then after a year or two's time, you'll be able to measure that and really see that, you know, your front end resources are able to have a greater bandwidth. Therefore, they can take on more projects, which an absolute fee is, you know, whatever, um, that's more than you otherwise would have had a shot at. Um, I think the errors and omissions go way down. I think uh, from a client perspective, you know, the concept cocktail napkin uh, concept budget versus what it ultimately cost you at the end of the job and that degree of uncertainty you know, certainly narrows. If you think about beta or, you know, that, that metric of volatility, it's, it goes way down and uh, everybody wins. Um, and I think the data, again, and the workflows provide a common or a single source of truth for everybody to be able to rely on because a good deal of inefficiency is generated by everybody having their own take on things and coming up with numbers or, you know, ideas that are coming from, you know, all different corners of the room as opposed to one agreed upon set of information. 
Yeah, um, and, I, and I think you mean you talked about it as well. You mentioned about the different parts of the room and obviously the different parts of the room that have got the most experience, the guys that are leaving the industry over the next five or 10 years, these guys, I mean, I, I believe we've got to download their information and their data before they go anywhere. And if we can do that, then we don't have to, have, not that we don't have to have these guys about, but we're able to do it a lot better. And, and then on the other side of that, on the lower scale, the guys come and graduate now and coming out with these, whether they're data sciences or ITs, and we're competing with Google and Facebook and, and Amazon, that we need to get these guys into construction to be able to help us with this because it's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a long play and it's, we're going to need as much talent as possible, but they need to see that we're, that construction are going in the right direction and they're, and they're, they're forward thinking. That's right. That's right. I mean, there's just, um, I think it's exciting for the younger people. If, you know, the industry does, you know, uh, commit and focus on, um, um, advancing the technologies, quite honestly, I think that incoming talent is going to demand it. Yeah. These, 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 um, these younger people graduating from college and deciding to make, you know, make a go of construction as a career and they come into your firm and all of a sudden they're dealing with, you know, uh, templates in Excel that have been around since like the late eighties, mm -hmm. they're going to be pulling their hair out. They yeah. want to have the tools at the fingertips that can more rapidly do the things they're accustomed to doing, whether it's their own personal, you know, um, you know, technology yeah. uh, uses, et cetera, but, you know, kind of get out of the stone ages here. Um, <laughs> have nothing well, else for, for talent attraction. But exactly. But is it going to be a case like it was with BIM VDC? Is it going to be a case of everybody's going to sit at the line like a horse race and the first horse that bolts out of the, off that line and goes and does this, everybody's just going to wait and like they're going to be the guinea pig. We're going to see how it, how it goes with those, those guys. Or are we going to see three or four companies or how, are we seeing three or four companies really going at this and investing a lot of capital and resources into it? Um, you know, I think the advent of BIM was really the industry's first real exposure to kind of the more high power, you know, technology and, and computed assistance um, that everybody may have been suspect of initially, but I think it showed the industry um, that technology is now an integral part of what we do and it makes a huge difference in the outcomes. And so I don't think the, the, the hill is as steep to climb as it was at the advent of, of BIM. Um, and I think people are starting to truly appreciate the power of data and what it can do as long as you harness it and structure it and then you have the, the program or the platform to do something with it. So I'm, I'm optimistic that that kind of adoption and realization um, isn't gonna cause a lot of people to wait for kind of those first movers to go try it out before they're bold enough to then jump in. Um, but you know, the risk they run if they do go that route is again, getting so far behind that they really can't catch up because I think it's a huge differentiator from a builder's perspective in in really winning the work and competing because it's really these days and it's kind of hard to differentiate yourself in the way that owners I think you know the the service has almost been commoditized yeah. and you know everybody's getting close to as much as we hate to admit but at face value look relatively equal but I would suggest that my personal experience as I looked at what, um, you know, made or break, whether we were winning projects or how somebody else perhaps even beat us, um, was really being able to show a thoughtful, detailed and systematic way of how to plan the project in pre-construction, knowing full well that that's gonna yield the greatest degree of success Mm -hmm. of outcome at the end of the project. And I think uh, owners have got started to get smart and recognizing how critical that phase is to the quality of their asset, to their pocketbook, and to the journey that they're gonna go on for two, three, four years with the builder and the architect. And so I think as a differentiator, I think it's also essential to really be able to demonstrate a true system and a true approach to data-driven decisions and visualization um, 
if, if nothing else, just to make sure you're winning your share of the work. Absolutely. But I still think within pre-construction, and this is why the pre-construction podcast exists, operations get so much limelight, they get so much radio time, they get so much exposure content. I think when I speak with pre-construction, BIM, VDC, pre-construction technology leaders, they're very happy to, and they're open to talk to me, but I think there's a lack of community where they're working together. Now, as you say, the secret sauce is in the data and it's in the people, but actually the processes to get that all together, I think there has to be more shared for us to move forward quick enough to be able to fulfill the demand that's coming. Uh, yeah, I would agree. I mean, certainly the construction phase has gotten more attention and, and I think, um, uh, which is great. I think the improvements in safety and all of the things where a lot of this focus uh, has occurred is it's good for the industry. It's good for all of us. And I think it just is a good um, example of if that same kind of focus can be put on pre-construction, um, you know, where really the table is being set and you know if you if you don't do that right it manifests itself and makes the construction phase that that much more difficult mm -hmm. but when you do do it right it's so smooth and it's so easy to execute and there's so much certainty that you know it really is uh, so essential to set that table correctly up front and that's not easy and mm -hmm. i think one of the other um say miss perceptions is when you think about pre-construction people who may not know any better equate that to estimating mm -hmm. and estimating is a, a function or a feature within the broader pre-construction um, spectrum of workflows and studies and all the things that go into what pre-construction professionals have to deal with and handle and do from you know, being a, a helping hand, or if you're the owner, you know, working through the entitlement process, um, the design and all of the things that everybody should be coming together to ensure that the design is of the highest quality, uh, has been um, reviewed to make sure it's, you know, everything is constructible. I mean, there's so much that goes on outside of just that estimating function, which is quite honestly, really just multiplication and addition you know you're you're doing a unit cost that you're selecting you're doing the quantities that you have surveyed and chose to enter and it's just multiplying it out and then adding up all those divisions and applying the markups and you have the total it's it's a calculation yeah. but the planning and the master scheduling and the constructability reviews and even the processes you go through, if there's a third party cost consultant and you're having to reconcile and compare numbers, all of these are workflows that go on in pre-construction every day, day in and day out. And they're time consuming. And there's a lot, there's not a lot of systematic approaches to any one of these, much less anything that stitches it all together. And I think, you know, I think the opportunity is, is um, essential for the industry. And it's it's endless. I mean, I, I can't wait to the first the first company that really comes out. I know I interviewed a few people from McCarthy and, and, and different GCs, and they are they've got Model Logics, which is an internal data data website that they use, um, and they're all kind of dipping their toe into it internally. But there's no one that's really, and maybe they are. Maybe when they go to a bid meeting and, and presenting to a client, they're saying, "Listen." This is how much we can guarantee. This is why we can guarantee that it's going to be in and around this price. Um, so maybe there are, but it'll be, it'll be really will be interesting. And I just hope and pray to God that someone comes out quickly and talks about it because there's not enough people talking about it because you, you need to talk about it to learn because the more you feel, the more you learn. It's as simple as that. And people have to feel to be able to be better and to deliver the, the, the demand on projects that's coming. You know, from an architect's perspective, you know, the, the vision that they had and have that ultimately um, be built or even enhanced in the process by, you know, tighter management of the budget uh, is, you know, something that they deserve. Yeah. I think it's a win all the way around. And it's really only going to be achieved when we can, you know, get away from these manual, inconsistent, non-standardized, non um, you know, workflows and applications um, and then if you also think at an enterprise level, I mean, that's in the context of one project. 
wouldn't it be nice if you had all of your projects uh, in a place where the data from those can come up and give you a little bit more uh, visibility and foresight as to what is your portfolio of projects looking like? What is the return on those projects? Whether you're an owner, an architect, or a builder, you know, as you're trying to run a business or run a division, having that information at your fingertips to be aware of the status and if there's something kind of going off the rails, know about it early so you can get into it and triage the situation before it kind of mushrooms on you. So, I mean, it's once you once you get that data and once you get those workflows at that project level dialed in, mm-hmm. then everything above that or, you know, above that in the hierarchy is so, automatic and, and um, very useful. Um, so it's kind of thinking out, out loud here, Steve. It, it, will this promote what you're talking about is data and workflows? The, the more data you get, obviously, the more workflows, how efficient they are, and then the, the more machine learning learn and, and the quicker it learns. Will this, will we see a lot of specialist general contractors then and only doing specific projects or maybe being involved in two or three markets? Will that be the future? Because if you've, if you're a general contractor that does everything, data centers, life, life sciences, healthcare, mixed use, interiors, light industrial, industrial, I mean, surely if you just build office buildings, mid to high rise office buildings, in all the big cities, the data you'll have on that there, you, you'll be able to predict it a little bit better. Will this, if we go down this line, will it, will we see more specialized contractors? Uh, it remains to be seen. I think if, um, if you have people that build just about everything, certainly with data, you know, the benefits are there, um, um, that help them project the cost of the projects more accurately, et cetera. But if you choose as part of your business model to focus on a particular project type and go really deep, you know, that, that certainly would give you an advantage in that market sector, but, you know, putting the whole data conversation aside, that's just a, a decision and a, and a business decision that a company would make as to whether that is going to achieve their objectives and goals. Yeah, uh, for what they have as a vision for their own company. And again, the stability of, of going in one sector wouldn't be probably a good decision should that that industry take a, a nosedive. Okay, yeah, interesting. Just thinking out loud. Um, well, listen, Steve, as always, this has been incredibly insightful. Um, loving to get, and I'm, I'm going to get you on again to talk about a couple of other things because I've got some great feedback from the first pre-construction podcast and people are picking particular topics that they want to hear you talk about. So thanks very much on the, on the, or sorry, the AI and yeah. machine learning. So I really appreciate your time. No, I appreciate, uh, you know, the focus you're providing to pre-construction because, you know, my whole career, 26 years, the first half of it was me being more on the operational end, but always being involved in the estimating in the bid room back then when that was more commonplace. But you know, helping our clients, et cetera, make these decisions, the appreciation and, and realization that pre-construction is really where it's at. And a lot of my colleagues who are more operationally oriented always grimace when I say it. But, <laughs> you know, for all the pre-construction professionals out there, you know, you need to realize how incredibly valuable, uh, you know, what you do and, and what you bring to the table is because, when you are at the table with the architect and the owner and, and setting the proverbial table, that makes the difference whether that project is uh, successful or whether it may not be successful. Uh, it's not so much uh, affected by the execution um, and you know, really making the project better and more profitable, et cetera. You know, really that action is happening in pre-construction and you know, executing the plan is what we did in operations, and it's and it's hard to make the project significantly better mm-hmm. in operations. But certainly, you can make it really <laughs> go, <laughs> go down if you don't execute well. But at least you know, if the table set properly, you have a fighting chance to have an extraordinarily positive outcome. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm, I I'm, I'm the focus you're bringing to this yeah uh, vital vital role in our industry and. Uh, um, if I could only encourage more and more people to really make 
pre-construction and the front end, um, really their career path, um, you know, we'd all be better for it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm all constantly telling contractor owners to, to, to really give your pre-construction and estimating team the credibility that they deserve because, I, I, I mean, I think they understand it, but I think they don't agree. They don't feel appreciated. I think across the board, if I, if I was to tell you one thing and the feedback I get from can, candidates, they just don't feel appreciated for the work that they put in um, because it is quite cyclical. And I know operations are working Saturdays and they're working 12-hour days, but pre-construction do the same. Bid days can be two, three days of 12-hour days. Um, and as you say, you can miss out by by a fraction. But it's, um, yeah, they, they need they need more. We need more team, team pre-con. We do. We do. So, All right. But thanks, Gareth. It's always enjoyable. And, yes. um, a pleasure, Steve. You're, you're a legend. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks.